Oh, the sheet. Oh, you. Yeah, I was in the implants one, and I. This sounds much cooler. Are you still in the Wednesday section? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you have one? Okay. Uh, last time uh, we uh, started to get into uh, maybe there's a better term for it, but the nitty gritty of how ions move across membranes and, and lead to the establishment of the potentials, the voltages across membranes, and it's those voltages which underlie everything else. Um, among other things, it underlies the way the brain works, uh, the way the nervous system works, because uh, it is those changes in transmembrane potential that give rise to nerve impulses or action potentials, to synaptic potentials, which we'll get to in due course. But also we'll see, uh, probably starting next week, that it is the electrical signals uh, in muscles uh, that trigger the muscles to contract. The muscles are not electrically driven energetically, but like the spark plugs in an engine, uh, it is the electrical spark of the action potential uh, that causes the actin and myosin in, in muscles to come together and, and produce uh, mechanical contraction. So that's getting us a little bit ahead of the game. Uh, so let's go back to where we were last time. We pointed out that if you started with the Uh, idea of having ionic concentration gradients uh, across a membrane, even if the total uh, concentration of the total number, if you will, of, of ions on both sides is equal, which it is approximately to keep uh, balance, there are uh, concentration gradients, and that is usually reckoned as the ratio of the concentration outside to the concentration inside of the cell. Uh, these concentration gradients uh, will cause ions to flow down the concentration gradient if there are open pathways for them to flow through, which would be through a channel or a pore in the membrane, which specifically allows one ion or another uh, to pass. There are cases where channels allow multiple ions, but those are the exception rather than the rule. So we uh, came to the uh, conclusion that if uh, there is a potassium concentration gradient, which, as we'll see, is, is, is always replenished, so even as ions move across, those ions get pumped out, much like the trickle charger in your car keeps the voltage of the car battery at 12 volts, even though there's always a drain on the battery, including the sparks to, to ignite the gas in the cylinders. Uh, uh, the offsetting of, of the diffusion gradient by the built-up electrical gradient, every time you transfer one charge, you have a capacitance of the membrane building up a small voltage, and this influx of potassium will continue until that electrical gradient uh, is equal and opposite in driving force to the electrical gradient, and you reach an electrochemical uh, equilibrium. And at that point, the membrane sits at a, p a potential which is equal to the potassium equilibrium potential. Or, as we'll see as we go along, uh, you can think of it as the battery for uh, potassium. Now, you can set up the mathematics for that equilibrium by noting that the energy uh, gained uh, electrically in charging the capacitance uh, is basically Vm per Coulomb. But if you take into account the valence of the ion and the conversion from Coulombs to moles, which is this F, which is uh, Faraday's constant, but maybe known more uh, colloquially as a, uh, as a fudge factor to us, uh, you have a term for the electrical energy for each Coulomb of charge that moves across. No, not each Coulomb, each equivalent, each uh, 10 to the 23rd ions. Uh, 
And uh, likewise, you can get an a, uh, energy statement for what happens when the ions cross the chemical gradient. And basically, that's proportional to the log of the concentration ratio times a couple of fudge factors, too. One is the absolute temperature. When the absolute temperature goes to zero, as you probably know, diffusion stops. That's essentially the definition of the uh, absolute uh, zero temperature. Uh, and then there's an international gas constant to make all this work, and that's R. If you equate these two terms to equilibrium, meaning that there is no energy, no net energy gained or lost, the system comes to an equilibrium, and the potential at which it does so, uh, uh, in this case for only potassium crossing, is given by this uh, equation with all these constants. And if, I don't think we mentioned this, but if you now uh, convert all these numbers into a constant, and while you're at it, you also convert from natural log to the base 10 log, which is more convenient, and even if it isn't, it's the way it's done, you wind up with a, a value of 0.061 volts times the log of the concentration ratio. Meaning if the concentration ratio is about tenfold, which it is uh, approximately for sodium and a little bit more for potassium, you would then have a potential of uh, about uh, uh, more, more than 80 millivolts, the actual figure uh, that the book uses. At least it does in most cases there. I'll warn you that there's an inconsistency from one chapter to the other. But the figure that the uh, textbook uses uh, is uh, minus 94 millivolts for this potassium battery. In other words, if you plug in this ratio, which is actually 35-fold, not 10-fold, uh, the, uh, the inside concentration, the, the inside concentration is, uh, oh, I believe about uh, uh, 4, and the outside concentration is 140. So you have uh, 0.061 times the log of a fraction of 135th. And I'm not going to do the algebra right here, but that's about what it comes down to. And that is what it should be. There should be about something less than 100 millivolts uh, for the potassium battery. And not surprisingly, as we'll see, that figure is somewhat greater than the resting potential of most cells. Most cells, when you make the measurement that we talked about by putting an electrode inside, uh, the potential is on the order of minus 70, minus 80 millivolts inside with respect to outside. So, and that's sometimes called V sub Z, is not Surprisingly, as we'll see, approximately the potassium equilibrium potential is just, it's a little bit lower. Meaning that the cell, the implication is that in the resting state, the potassium channels are open and other uh, ion channels are not, or not to any appreciable degree. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know if we went past this. Oh, well, here's the let's go through the exercise again, uh, but this time think about uh, uh, sodium. Let's magically and we'll talk about what the magic is shut off all these potassium channels so potassium can't get in and only allow sodium to penetrate. Well, the same equilibrium could be set up, except in this case you're dealing with sodium concentrations. But all these fudge factors, all these constants are the same, so you wind up with an expression for the sodium equilibrium potential, which uh, is RT on ZF natural log of 
sodium concentration outside the cell. Hopefully you can make that out. Na sub zero over Na sub i, just like it was here. And uh, uh, that translates again to 61 millivolts or 0 0.061 volts uh, and this translates to the log to the base 10 when you get rid of all these constants. Which means that if you go back to the concentrations that typically exist inside and outside the cell, you wind up with a voltage. Let me uh, take the figure that we'll be using later. I had to tell you that, that the figures, if you look at chapter 4 and 5, there's some inconsistency, but uh, they're, they're uh, approximately the same in each chapter. So we're going to try to stay consistent. Uh, the concentration ratio of, of the sodium is uh, uh, something... Um, on the order of tenfold, uh, where the outside concentration is ten times the inside concentration. I believe the figures, you can go look them up again, it's, it's like 140 outside, ten inside. The important thing is that it's approximate, it's in the same order of magnitude as the con potassium ratio, but it's in the opposite direction. So as we implied here by the physics, when sodium goes down the concentration gradient, it's going to leave a positive charge inside relative to the outside. And consistent with that, the arithmetic turns out to be that the uh, VNA is plus, plus, not minus, uh, about 61 millivolts. So now you have two situations which drive the membrane potential to complete opposites. And in fact, they pretty much define the range over which the voltage changes ordinarily. It can sometimes get higher than uh, the VK, uh, but uh, it, it's, I don't think there are situations where it, it gets anywhere near to or exceeds VNA on the, on the positive side you can uh, do the same exercise uh, for other ions. You can go back, you can look at chloride. Uh, let's just take a look at it uh, diagrammatically because it's one thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, let's, make the, let's make chloride orange just for jollies. So if you have chloride, it turns out that chloride, which is a negative ion, is higher in concentration outside than inside, just like sodium. In fact, we talk about the fact that uh, the outside concentration is, is essentially salt water, NaCl. The chloride ion goes through, and you might think that the effect would be the same as sodium. But is the inside going to be negative or positive? It's going to be negative because the concentration gradient is in the same direction, but you got a negative ion here. So chloride actually is giving you the same potential range close to, to what the potassium does. And if you go back to the arithmetic on it, you wind up with the same 61 millivolts times the log of chloride out over chloride in, and seemingly this should give you a positive number. But here, uh, we're tripping ourselves up, and if you worry about these little details, it's, it's like getting the deductions right in your income tax. What is the valence back here of Z? Mm -hmm. Z is equal to minus 1. So in fact, for a negative ion, this number becomes minus 61. So you've got to take into account two things which tend to oppose each other. One is the direction of the concentration gradient, and the other is the 
polarity of the ion. And if you can't sort of remember the set formula, uh, you can always go back to this sort of diagram and, and just look at the, the uh, physics of it. Okay, there are other ions that can cross the membrane and make some contribution, ions like calcium and magnesium, etc. But these three guys, chloride, uh, uh, sodium, and potassium, and, and particularly sodium and potassium, are uh, the big guys on the block in terms of determining uh, membrane potential. Uh, other ions like calcium are more uh, enzymatic in their action. They're, they don't change the voltage much, but they do uh, affect the behavior of the cell. For example, in the aforementioned case of a muscle contraction, the signal generated electrically actually results in an influx of calcium, and it's the calcium influx, just a teeny weeny bit, that actually catalyzes the uh, mechanical contraction, the coming together of these molecules. So that, that's something we'll, we'll get back to. Okay, any questions about this sort of arithmetic and, and uh, So, um, let's start with a clean slate here. If we look at this from an electrical mo uh, circuit model, you don't have separate uh, uh, elements for capacitance, resistance, and the batteries of the ions. These are distributed, but like uh, other distributed systems you've, you've come to know, you can represent it by, by uh, lumped elements. So the most direct electrical component that you can just see by looking at the membrane is the capacitance. And interestingly enough, it comes out to be just about one microfarad per square centimeter uh, for just about every membrane. It's like, a, it's like Mother Nature just started with that figure. It's just lucky that the units uh, that we gave later uh, work out well. Now, in parallel with the capacitance, you have channels through which ions can pass if those channels are open. So there is a conductance which is also the reciprocal of the resistance. And we're going to use conductance uh, from now on more than resistance. Uh, if the conductance is uh, non-zero, then a potential would appear across this circuit equal to this voltage source that we uh, apply. And this voltage source, if this is the potassium conductance, would uh, connotate the potassium battery. And the value of that battery, from what we talked about before, is something on the order of minus a tenth of a volt. I think we've used about minus 94 millivolts. Um, and for those of you uh, who haven't looked at your circuits in a while, we're using sort of standard notation that the uh, voltage source is defined as positive on the top of the circuit, which is the inside of the membrane, and negative on the ground side or the outside. And indeed, uh, that's how uh, membrane electrical models are denoted, that the outside is always the, the, the ground, and that's how you actually measure it uh, for an amplifier uh, outside with, with the ground being the electrode that sits outside the membrane and the inside being the glass pipette that we talked about being stuck in there. Okay, so uh, you can see where this would cause the potential across the membrane between the outside and the inside, which we're calling Vm, to simply be the same as, as Vk. There's no, there's no other voltage it can be which is uh, not untypical of the resting state of the membrane. 
Okay, now supposing you go back and you play the game with the sodium equilibrium potential. Again, the, the source is connoted minus outside to plus inside, but the numerical value here is something like plus 61 millivolts. And I'm going to stop using millivolts because unless I say anything else, we're talking about millivolts. Uh, so when I just leave out numbers, you'll, you'll understand that those are millivolts if, the, if it's a voltage. Okay, if this value of the sodium conductance is small, close to zero, then you basically have the potassium battery dominating. Conversely, if you reduce this conductance to zero and open up this conductance, or you make this conductance much greater than, make GNA much greater than GK, then the potential will go towards VNA. And in fact, you can build a little generator, like Mother Nature has, in which you can make the voltage swing from VK to VNA, if you do certain things at different times. For example, one thing you might do is, what if you make GK equal to GNA? And just from the circuit standpoint. Or just think about symmetry. Well, there's no reason to think that the potential will be any closer to VNA than it is to VK, right? Well, if you work out the arithmetic, which we'll do in a minute, you'll see that the voltage would have to fall halfway in between. So if these two are equal, then the potential will be the sum of the two divided by two, the average, which would be like 100 and, and what is that? That's like uh, minus 33. I believe, if I'm not incorrect, uh, 33.17, so you're uh, looking at something like minus 17 millivolts. You can check my numbers, which I'm doing on the fly, but it's basically halfway in between. So if you change the value of GNA to GK from zero to unity, the, in a step, this voltage will swing from VK, because that's what it is when VNA is, when the conductance is all potassium. It will swing over with a time constant, which we'll get back to later, to a voltage that's about halfway in between. Now, uh, if you've taken circuit theory, you know that this is a pretty half-assed way to figure out what's going on. What you want to do is really write the uh, equation for the circuit. So in fact, we can go back and uh, look at currents. Yeah, let's take a different color. Let's take red here. Oops, why does it want to do that? I'll make it green. Maybe this isn't like red. Come on, baby. Ink color, green. I don't understand what it's doing. Hmm. Help, I seem to have lost the ability to control the pen. It can knock on the door. I'm not getting, I'm not able to bring up my pen. Thank you. In color, make it green. Now bring up the pen. Well, it doesn't. I'm sorry, when I go to color, it makes the pen disappear.
Okay. Thank you. I don't know why it didn't work the other way, but whatever. So we have a, uh, a capacitive current. We have a current through the ion, uh, the potassium ion channel, and we have a current uh, through the sodium channels. And if we had more ions, we could just put branches in parallel. And uh, as you recall, unless you connect a voltage source across this, which we might get into later, the sum of the currents into a node equals zero. So the capacitive current plus the potassium current plus the sodium current add up to zero. But we want to get the voltages involved. So what is the capacitive current? It's C dV dt. But if we're talking about just going from one steady state to the other, except for this transition, here and here, the voltage is not changing, so this uh, term will ignore. But what about the potassium current? Well, the potassium current is given by Ohm's law. It is this voltage difference, Vm minus Vk, divided by this resistance, or in our vernacular, it's times the conductance. Likewise, the sodium current is uh, this term. So these two terms have to add up to zero. IK plus INA has to add up to zero. And then if you solve for VM, you find that VM is simply GK, VK plus GNA, VNA over the sum of GK plus GNA. And as a quick check, you can see that if, if GNA is equal to zero, this term goes to zero and VM is equal to VK. The GKs cancel out. Likewise, uh, if GK is zero, this goes to VNA. And finally, if GK and GNA are both unity, then uh, this gives you the sum of the voltages divided by two, which is the average, just as we predicted. So this means that uh, as the, if you kind of do this experiment again, but this time you slowly change this ratio, and in fact, if you go past unity, then uh, if you do it slow enough so the capacitive current is not an issue, you will slowly drive the uh, potential from VK to VNA. If you do it rapidly, as we'll see later, then you get something in principle that goes more rapidly, but also has uh, some... Uh, other characteristics because the capacitive current then becomes important. If dV dt becomes significant as it does during the action potential, uh, then uh, this uh, slow ramp uh, doesn't necessarily follow. Now finally, and hopefully this pen will work now, oh. doesn't give me much variety. Supposing we have another ion involved. Supposing uh, we want to bring the chloride battery into the picture. So this would be VCL, and it turns out that it's approximately minus 60 millivolts. It has about the same magnitude, but the opposite polarity is VNA. Now you can't just do the averaging. You've got to sum these. So... If you go back, this now becomes plus VM minus VCL times GCL. So you have three currents plus the capacitance that sum. And not surprisingly, it just adds the equivalent terms to the numerator and denominator. 
And if you add a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a ten thousandth uh, species of ions, uh, you could just string out this equation. So in fact, you can make a generalization that Vm is the sum of the terms Gi, uh, V, well, call it, uh, oops. Gx, uh, well, it doesn't like it when I, over the sum of just the Gx's, where x is a particular ion. And if you have a thousand ions, uh, Gk, uh, k would vary from one to a thousand. But in our case, we are generally dealing with two or three ions to play the game with. Okay, uh, any, any uh, questions about this? Now, if you're, if you're, Circuit theory is a little fuzzy. You may want to go back and, and, and look at this. Now, uh, you'll notice that this uh, version is not in the textbook. This is my attempt to kind of bring the uh, text version into the engineering vernacular that I assume you guys are uh, more at home with. Okay, so now... Um, we can, if we were Mother Nature, we can make Vm, which is a function of time, do anything uh, we want it to do. We could, for example, make the conductance ratio go from zero, that is sodium is closed, potassium is open, to something that is approximately the opposite. Uh, we make that ratio 100-fold. In other words, we, if we have uh, 10 potassium channels open in a small area and we open up 1,000 sodium channels, then the sodium uh, will, will dominate. And as you would expect from the equation or just from reasoning it out, that would cause the membrane potential to follow the same trajectory with some small difference in terms of uh, time because of the capacitance, but we won't worry about that so much. So you can make the voltage swing all the way from VK to VNA by changing this ratio of conductances. And then if you want to go back to where you started from, you turn around and you bring that back, and lo and behold, the uh, potential comes all the way back down. And indeed, if you look at a typical action potential, the impulse that we talked about, the nerve impulse, it pretty much follows that time course, except that it actually starts somewhat below VK, which is, which is the typical resting potential. Because there is some conductance to ions other than potassium, then it swings up to something short of VNA, comes back down, and then it goes all the way down to VK because VK actually gets bigger. Uh, this ratio starts low, but it actually gets high, and then it gets even closer to zero. So the action potential goes through this uh, little dance of getting more positive, which we talk about as being a depolarization, DP, depolarization, loss of the negative potential, which includes not just loss of negative potential absolutely going from, uh, say, uh, minus, uh, minus 80 millivolts or so at rest to uh, zero, but also to keep going in a positive direction. So even though this should be technically uh, a depolarization and a reversal of polarization, that's just too many words, so we speak of it as a depolarization. On the other hand, making the inside potential more negative than the rest, or more negative in any general uh, conversation, 
uh, say going from minus 80 to minus 90, as you would by making GK even bigger, uh, that is spoken of as a hyperpolarization. Uh, these terms are, are in the text. Uh, HP, not to be confused with Hewlett Packard. So we were using these initials DP, HP, and uh, RP is the resting potential. And whether you think of this in terms of happening on the membrane or think of it as being the variation of the resistors, uh, you, can, you can get the transmembrane potential uh, to follow whatever trajectory uh, you want uh, from one extreme to the other, one extreme being uh, VK, the other extreme being VNA in this game. What about changing other things about the membrane? Well, it said the capacitance doesn't change. It's just inherently there. You might think, well, another way to generate the signal is to bounce around VNA and VK by, by changing the batteries, such as by changing the ion concentrations. Well, it turns out that doesn't happen. The reason it doesn't happen is that there is a constant activity of a charging device, an active pump, as we'll, we'll see in a couple of minutes. Uh, and even if the pump turns off, like the trickle charger on your battery, uh, it takes many minutes uh, for these concentrations to change. There's a lot of latency. Just like if your uh, alternator went out while you were driving along, your car battery would, would, would keep its voltage uh, for something approaching an hour's worth of, of driving time. Uh, so, this doesn't change, this doesn't change, this capacitance doesn't change. What we're talking about, Mother Nature uh, building in as tweakable, as denoted by these arrows, is the opening and closing of these channels, which in the case of the circuit model, gets denoted by the change of, of conductance. <laughs> Let me point out one other thing to further compound this uh, uh, picture. Well, it doesn't want to. I don't know why that pen is playing such games with me, but we'll take what we can get. There is a, another um, characteristic that is related to the channel opening and closing. It's called the permeability. And it really is not necessary for our discussion, but it's mentioned in the book. The conductance inherently um, depends on the availability of ions. So if you, take, if you make the concentration of potassium ions on either side of the membrane zero, you not only make this voltage infinite, because you have the uh, log of infinity, something over zero, but you're also taking away the conductance. So this... So this so this um, uh, this equation then doesn't work for extreme values of, of concentrations. But that never happens in life. It might happen in some artificial membrane uh, in a laboratory. But the more, another way of looking at the membrane potential is to use this permeability indicator. And what you wind up with, and I'm not going to go through all this, is that Vm then becomes the aforementioned 61 millivolts times the log of the um, permeability times the outside concentration over the permeability times the inside concentration. And if I stop there for a second, you can see that this, the PKs now cancel out and you simply have 61 log of this concentration ratio, which is the same thing as what the, what the aforementioned uh, battery value is. What's slightly different though is that if you have a, uh, a sodium permeability, which is non-zero,
And this, to be consistent, should be the O's over the I's. Because you should have a negative potential, and this, this, this should be the log of a, a number less than unity to give you a negative potential. So this is PNA times NA O over NAI. And pardon my, I should, I'll, I'll rewrite it when we get to the next frame. Um, this equation is mentioned in the textbook. Uh, it is called the Goldman equation. Even though it looks different in terms of P's versus G's and, and the way they plug in, in terms of ratios, if you calculate the voltage taking permeability ratios from near zero, like from 0.01 to 1,000, calculate the voltage, and then do the same thing for conductance ratios, you get about the same number. In fact, we'll give you a little numerical exercise. Now, the reason I mention it, because it's in the book, and uh, you should just beware that it is not necessary to use this equation uh, apart from the other equation. My suggestion is you stay with the conductance model, which is consistent with uh, electric circuit uh, elements, uh, etc. Okay, now let's go on with the show here, literally the slideshow. So here's what we uh, that got us into all this business was the uh, uh, observation that the sodium is about 10 times more concentrated outside. Uh, so here it's 14. In, in the next chapter, it's, it's 10, but it's, it's typical. The potassium ratio is, is 35 to 1 going the other way. Uh, the chloride which is down here, is about 25 to 1 uh, in the same direction as sodium. So you get a negative battery potential from that. And this all comes out of diffusion. The amount of diffusion uh, increases with temperature at absolute zero. There is no diffusion. And if we look at a membrane, uh, as we did in more detail uh, last time, uh, what we've been uh, focusing on so far is the proteins that allow ions to go through the uh, membrane, such as having a lot of sodium outside the cell, driving sodium into the cell, and vice versa uh, for potassium, etc. In the whole vernacular of things that, that um, We'll come across later, but particularly uh, uh, later on, an ion can also cross the membrane by what's called facilitated diffusion, that instead of just going through a hole, the ion attaches to the protein structure and is sort of carried across. There's a little truck. Uh, that same notion of uh, the ion hopping a lift, if you will, is even more important in terms of what we call active transport. Which we can think of as uphill transport. This is, these two things are downhill. These are the ions running down the diffusion gradient. And as we've alluded to, uh, oh, the active transport is right there. Uh, Eventually, such movements of sodium and potassium will destroy the gradients. You you'll fill up the cell uh, with sodium and the potassium uh, will leak out. So you need this trickle charger, if you want to put it that way, to keep the ion gradients constant. And suffice to say that, they, that it works well enough so that in life, or as long as the cell is alive, the concentration gradients don't change very much. Indeed, 
the thing that kills the cell is if the, if for example oxygen is cut off to a cell, uh, stop breathing, uh, oxygen goes down, the trickle charger goes down, and then the uh, batteries decline, and the cell becomes electrically inoperable, and that leads to other problems which uh, can, can cause death, or at least can cause unconsciousness first, hopefully, uh, and then you restore breathing, etc. Uh, you hear about kids trying to hold their breath until they pass out. Well, uh, you can do that, but uh, nature has made you pass out because once you pass out, your reflexes take over and you start breathing again. Uh, unless you've taken some particularly bad stuff. Okay, so that, that is the kinds of things we run into. And of course, ubiquitously is the membrane capacitance, this lipid bilayer. Uh, this just gives us some, this just gives you an idea of the the size of different ions, uh, there's not a heck of a lot of difference uh, in the size of ions, but there's a difference in the degree to which they can get through the membrane. Now, water can actually go through the lipid bilayer. It doesn't need channels. So on this scale, water uh, is very permeating. Water moves back and forth all the time, which is good because if you have a uh, osmotic gradient, if too much ion gets inside or outside the cell, the water will very quickly move across to keep the uh, osmotic pressure from building up. So if, you, if you're worried about that, uh, uh, don't be. And then when you get down to things like uh, sodium and potassium, you can see that uh, they have in the uh, base state of the membrane before the channels open, very little ability to permeate. Now what did I just do here? Where is my, come on baby. Uh, okay. So now we can get more specific. These are uh, cartoon-like pictures. There is a figure in, in the newer text version, but not in the old one, that shows if you're so inclined, the actual molecular details of how a, a channel is built. But suffice to say, uh, these, are, these are protein lined holes. So the sodium uh, can slip in as long as the hole is open. And uh, what happens is that there are gates that open and close. Now, in the case of the uh, potassium, the, there's only one gate that opens or closes. Uh, as we'll see as we go along, for the sodium channel, there are two gates that can be envisioned cartoon-like as uh, uh, opening and closing, and they tend to open and close reciprocally so that uh, the opening of both gates is a transient phenomenon. One closes slowly when one, one opens. And indeed, one of the characteristics of the sodium conductance is that it's, uh, that it's low 99% of the time, but when you want to produce an action potential, you tweak it to open and then it automatically closes because one gate opens and the other starts to close a bit more slowly. And for some fraction of a millisecond, actually, both gates uh, stay open during an AP. That's not true for the potassium. The potassium uh, gate can stay open uh, on a constant basis. And indeed, uh, when it's opened, you, you produce the resting case, whereas VM is very close to uh, VK. Okay, so we have, obviously, when these channels open, they produce a, a, uh, a little bit of a change in the membrane conductance. And indeed, the little bit can be uh, determined, as we'll see, by doing what's called a, a, a patch clamp. 
and you get a figure of about per channel, you can actually get this down to the single channel, of about 10 uh, Pico Siemens. Which is 10 to the minus uh, 11th Siemens. Or the resistance across here is uh, 10 to the 11th ohm. So it's a very small conductance, but you have to have a lot of them uh, in parallel to, to one channel is not going to make a, a big difference. But if you have a million channels opening in a small area, that can bring the overall conductance of sodium up to and greater than the overall conductance for potassium. Okay, so here is what is called a, uh, a patch clamping approach. Oops. I don't know why this thing is playing games with me on the... So... It's, it's called a patch clamp, uh, but it's actually a form of a, a circuit that we'll talk about in more detail with a voltage clamp, where what you're actually doing is you're uh, taking electrodes and connecting them to a circuit which allows you to step change the membrane potential or to apply some chemical which would tweak the channels to open or close. And you can either take a piece of a cell membrane that is just a little bit bigger than that of the opening of the electrode, which is typically on the order of about one uh, micrometer, one, one to ten maybe microns, enough so that you get down to pieces of membrane whose conductance can be alluded to, to specific channels. You can, get it, you can get down to a single channel. You can apply a substance or a voltage change, and what you see here is that the current that goes uh, through the patch will actually step from one level to another. In this case, it's about a change of three pico amps. which is about 3 times 10 to the minus uh, 12th amp. So you're getting down to some really fine circuitry. And uh, a guy who happened to have been a colleague of mine, uh, his name is Erwin Nair. Uh, he was actually a graduate student when I met him. Uh, invented this methodology, and he, he won the Nobel Prize for this uh, concept and the ability to design circuits, especially given the uh, modest electronics available back in the uh, 60s and 70s to, to measure these picoamp currents. Well, if you divide the three picoamps uh, by the voltage across here, then you get to the conductance ratio, which gets you around 10 uh, pico siemens so that's that's the that, that's the accounting but the important thing is you don't have a gradation these these channels are kind of all or none so the conductance which on a macroscopic level seems to be continuously variable as we've discussed when you get down to this microscopic level you see that it actually consists of uh, quantified or quantum units, if you will, of, of holes that are open or closed. Now, you could say, well, why couldn't Mother Nature make these things partially open and partially closed? Well, she could have, and there are examples, uh, as there are everywhere you look, of, of variants. So there are some channels that have intermediate states. They're not, they're not just zeros or ones in the binary sort of vernacular. But that's, that's the exception uh, rather than the rule. So now that we can, now we can use this not only to measure the conductance, but we can see that the conductance 
is, is uh, quantized. And indeed, uh, here's a little exercise which may or may not make sense. I hope I get the numerics right. If you look at a, uh, a centimeter square, about a poster size piece of membrane, which would be a lot of cells, uh, you find that the, uh, the, so the, the potassium conductance, the resting conductance, uh, uh, might be on the order of about one milli semen or 10 to the minus three semens for a square centimeter. That's just for making the uh, measurement uh, holistically. And then if you use the patch clamp to measure the individual channel, uh, you come to the conclusion that it's about 10 to the minus 11 semen per channel. And then if you take the ratio of these two, you wind up with the with a figure of about 10 to the eighth channels per square centimeter. which would be a grid of about 10 to the 4th times 10 to the 4th, 10,000 channels, 10,000 rows, which means that the interspacing of the channels would, would uh, work out numerically to be about 1 micron. And indeed, that's kind of consistent with what you see. Now, the channels are a lot smaller than a micron, so about uh, something like 1% or less of the area of the membrane is taken up by the channels, and that still gives you enough um, of a change in the conductance uh, to account uh, for what you see. Sodium channels uh, have about the same abundance, but those channels in the resting state are, are closed, and then they come on and overwhelm the potassium, as, as we'll see. So that's kind of the uh, the, the, the microscopic picture, or even the submicroscopic picture. Uh, if you are talking about these pores, these are just the uh, passive pores, then uh, the rate of diffusion is proportional to the concentration gradient. Uh, and you can distinguish that from the aforementioned uh, 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 piggyback ride uh, of facilitated diffusion because you reach a maximum, even if you increase the concentration beyond the, uh, uh, what I'll call, don't look for this term in the book, the piggyback capacity of the channel, uh, then it saturates. So if you want to know whether you're getting ions across a barrier, including a membrane, by simple diffusion versus this, uh, act this piggyback ride thing, you see whether you have an Ohm's law sort of relationship between concentration, gradient, and diffusion, or whether you have a, uh, a saturation effect. Small thing. And, uh, well, let's not belabor this. This is the facilitated diffusion mechanism. Here's the little uh, piggy onto which you carry the molecule. Okay, well, um, we're not going to talk about osmotic pressure and all that. Suffice to say that because mo water can freely move across the membrane, even if you have a buildup of solid materials on one side or the other, uh, you'll create a transient osmotic difference and the water will just scoot across so fast that, uh, in fact, the osmosis never really takes place. Uh, certainly that's the case in, in animal cells. In plant cells, as some of you may or may not know, you have, a, you have a stiff wall of the cell, so you can build up osmotic gradients, but we're not talking about plants. We're talking about animals and people, so we will uh, leave the uh, osmosis uh, behind. Now, uh, how do you get the 
gradient restored, what we call the trickle charger here. What you want to do is you want to take the sodium that's leaking in and the potassium that's leaking out uh, to reverse because if the sodium leaks in, you'll lose the sodium battery. If the potassium leaks out, you lose the potassium battery. But fortunately, you have this uh, active transport system And you could envision any number of systems in which you have a, uh, uh, a pump that pumps sodium out and a separate pump that pumps potassium in. Or what would be the most logical, in a sense, would be a pump that uh, does both at the same time, that each time sodium goes out, a potassium comes in. So it's essentially uh, exchanging an exchange pump for three potassiums for three sodiums. But the number actually is not three. But the ratio is, is three to two. Why nature built it that way uh, is subject to speculation and it's sort of, uh, I don't know what the speculation is these days, but uh, that's the way it comes. So the pump actually produces a small net current. If you simply had one potassium for one sodium, the net charge transfer would be zero. But here you're bringing in, uh, you're taking out more positive charge than you're bringing in. So you say, well, isn't that going to affect the membrane potential. Well, you could ask the same question. Isn't your trickle charger going to change the voltage of your car battery? So how can you call the car battery 12 volts? Well, again, uh, the trickle charger works on a constant but slow basis compared to the uh, very rapid cycles of, of charging and discharging. And there's just a lot of essentially battery mass. The same thing here, that if you have a small net current, it does not amount to much compared to the other currents that are already there. So you can ignore it for most purposes. There are situations that you may come across in the literature, etc., or maybe it's uh, referred to in the textbook, uh, where the act of transport accelerates and, and goes into a, uh, a sort of a hyper state, just like the trickle charger might, the generator of the car might uh, have to come up if you had a big, let's say you had a big discharge of the uh, battery. In fact, a good analogy uh, could be that it's a cold morning and you have to you start the car and you keep cranking, you have to keep cranking the motor and the battery will run down to the point where the voltage will actually drop and what will happen is that your generator uh, uh, leading to the recharging will accelerate and, and the voltage actually might be directly affected. Same thing here, if the active transport has to go into uh, souped up activity, then the small net current could become important in the uh, economy of, of the voltage. There are situations where you have uh, a lot of activity. When a neuron fires a lot of impulses, the cell actually will hyperpolarize below the normal resting potential uh, for some uh, few seconds afterwards due to the uh, fact that the active transport is, is showing its uh, effect. That is a variation on the theme, but uh, in some cases it can be more important than others. Uh, we'll kind of skip over this. It's also possible to couple the sodium transport to the uh, uh, transport of glucose. Glucose has to come into a cell too, and it's also um, uh, done in conjunction with other, uh, with other ion movements. And uh, that will be the end of that chapter. 
uh, we're not going to talk about the fact that you can have uh, transport uh, uh, across multiple layers of, of cells, uh, uh, such as uh, you have in uh, uh, skin and other situations. So don't worry about this one. Now, let me see if I can go back to... Let's see if this will work, if I ex try to escape this chapter. Ah, it worked. Oh, I think it's working so far. Keep your fingers crossed. And now we'll swing over uh, to chapter 5, we hope. At Chapter 5, uh, we won't get uh, deep into today, so many of the figures that I handed out, uh, we, we will get into uh, uh, next time. Uh, so, uh, Chapter 5 starts out by kind of restating what we just talked about, that uh, uh, if you've got a, a, a nerve cell, uh, sometimes uh, referred to uh, as a uh, nerve fiber, oops, got to go back through the process. So, the two terms uh, are synonymous, but I'll probably use cell. Uh, if the potential is dominated by the potassium, uh, the membrane potential will go to something like minus 94, which is what we said is about what VK is. If you shut down all of these, let me go to a different color actually. Let's see if this will work. Oops. Yeah, it does, but now I've got to go back to it. So if you essentially turn off the potassium channels, turn on the sodium channels, you go from something close to VK to something close to VNA, as happens, uh, as we'll see during this uh, action potential. The way you can measure these potentials, as we've already pointed out, is to put a small uh, uh, conducting solution-filled uh, tube with a tip opening, which is big enough to keep the conductance, to keep it conducting, but is still small enough to poke in without doing damage, and it's on the order of about 0.1 microns. And the, and the membrane seals around this, just like a self-sealing tire, and you don't use an old uh, galvanometer like this, shows, and even the current tech shows, but you would use a, an oscilloscope or even these days a computer hooked up to measure that potential. Uh, and this is presumably the, the resting potential, uh, which is a little bit high, but it, it's within the ballpark. We'll skip over that. Um, and uh, as we've just pointed out, uh, there are two types of, of uh, things that happen when the uh, sodium channels are, are open, the, the sodium uh, comes in. When the potassium channels are open, the potassium goes out. And that's because the gradients are opposite, and that in turn is due to the aforementioned uh, uh, pump action. So this is all kind of a restatement. This just shows the details of the uh, calculation of these uh, equilibrium potentials, and I'll point out to you that there is some small difference in the numbers that are given in Chapter 5 and Chapter 4, or so it seemed to me. Yeah, but if you see that, uh, and again, this is just another example of, of, of the notion that the sodium comes in, it's pumped out, and vice versa for potassium. Okay, now... If you take a, a nerve cell, particularly a large axon, and a typical axon that is used in these experiments is uh, uh, 
comes from a squid because they have very large axons and you can poke these electrodes in all day and not, and not do too much harm. And also the axon is not covered by what's called myelin, whose role we'll, we'll see later on. Uh, and if you, in addition to recording the potential, you put in a pulse of current and you cause the resting potential, as we've talked about uh, uh, previously somewhat, to decrease, to depolarize, and you hit a threshold, then the membrane goes into its own little uh, dance routine in which it continues to uh, uh, depolarize, then turns around and repolarizes. And indeed, uh, this figure is not quite correct because it also uh, comes even more in the hyperpolarized direction, even closer to VK. So it goes from the resting potential, which is near VK, to the peak of the action potential, or the overshoot from zero, which is up near where the uh, sodium battery is. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and next time we'll, we'll pick up and talk about how the action potential uh, is produced uh, in terms of these uh, circuit models. And uh, even perhaps more uh, important physiologically is how the action potential moves from spot to spot because this nerve impulse does you no good if it just stays in one spot. It is the information, it is the impulse that moves up and down the, the nerve fibers that carries information from place to place. Okie dokie, if you have any questions, uh, come on up. Uh, I presume everybody who is here is, is okay with the... Uh, enrollment, we didn't have a waiting list, so everything is hunky gory that way. And in school today, can I tell you after that?